I remember when we were first deciding to move overseas, we had a meeting with each of our four kids who were little at the time. Like I think our youngest was one year old and uh, one of the phrases that came out in the family meeting was we do hard things. So we're saying we are in a war-torn African country. Uh, we're being uh, ambiguous about the name of the country because there's very high persecution. And so the norm here is to kidnap, beat, and kill uh, Christians. So it's a uh, very serious thing. Regular prayer that we pray in the car as we leave in the morning is thank you God for one more day in this city because we never know when the last day will be. Why are we doing what we're doing? When I was a teenager, Bruce McAvoy was the youth pastor at Chapel Street and Jeff Frazier was the new senior high pastor at Chapel Street. There was just a deep conviction of uh, who God is, who he is to me, and that I'm ready to go to the ends of the earth to do anything that he calls me to do. Our decision to move to this part of Africa was a statistical decision. There's dozens of unengaged people groups that no one was going to because of the persecution. Factions in this country are fighting uh, with each other. More than half a million people uh, have been internally displaced and, and have left their homes. There hasn't been good education in this country for a decade. Yeah, pe people fear for their safety. I, I remember I was, I was in a car uh, with a friend. He was new to this country and he had said, so Doug, what is the message that you think people most need to hear? And I thought about it for a while. Hope. The title, Hope School, was actually the idea of a Muslim business guy in the community who saw that we were doing hope camps, hope clubs, and parent trainings to teach resiliency skills for families. And he said, Doug, you have hope camps, you have hope clubs, you should have hope school. He said, I have an 86,000 square foot facility that you can use rent free this message of hope is what our community needs. We started Hope School this past September with 120 students, which by October was 180 students. We have about 20% of the building set up with classrooms. About 80% of the building still needs development. There's so much that can be done, but like we don't have kitchens, we don't have refrigerators or microwaves, like there's, so there's certain pieces, there's not things for the kids to play with at recess. The mission is we want to bring hope and healing to traumatized families and ultimately we want them to develop a relationship with Jesus and follow Jesus. We believe each child has a unique God-given identity and special calling. We teach through different character traits, and each of those character traits line up with the fruit of the Spirit. Education so lines up with the Christian worldview that we can ask whatever question we want, uh, we can share whatever doubt we want, and that the answers will line up with our faith. And we believe if in this culture we develop a generation that learns to think critically this is going to cause a seismic shift in how they approach who God is. As we do hard things, we kind of feel weak, but in that, God shows himself to be strong. 
And in doing hard things, we have experienced way more joy, way more of a sense of who God is and connection with Him. This has been our hardest year ever. It's also been our most fulfilling, joyous year of significance. Daddy sang bass, mama sang tenor, me and little brother joined right in. Singing seems to help a troubled soul. One of these days and it won't be long, I'll be joining the song. I'm going to join the family circle at the throne. Oh, the circle. One of the things I love about that video is it doesn't matter if you're in North Africa or in Geneva, uh, adolescents don't want to sing what their mom tells them to sing. <laughs> You've been watching and hearing the story of what God's doing uh, through Doug and Carrie and their family. I had breakfast with Doug uh, just this past week. He and his wife and children are in the States to celebrate Christmas. And uh, this past week, I had somebody in our church family ask me the question, is this a worthwhile investment? It seems risky. I mean, if Christians are being persecuted, if it's a war-torn country, if it... How do we know that our investment of uh, half a million dollars should God bless through our generosity is what, if, what happens if that building's bombed or if that family's, you know, exported? It's a good question. I asked Doug that question over breakfast and he was saying, you know, when Jesus sends out the, the, the disciples in Luke chapter 10, he tells them to go two by two and look for a person of peace in the community. Meaning somebody in that area who may not believe what you believe but gives you favor. And he told story after story after story of individuals in this country who were persons of peace. You heard one of them, right? A Muslim man who said, listen, we may not agree and believe the same thing, but we need what you're doing here. And this is a person of influence, a person of peace in the community. So um, uh, we're, we have raised $200,000 with $300,000 from the goal. If you're new, if you're a guest, if you're visiting, we're just glad that you're here. But for those of you that may feel led to give, uh, we had an individual come to us this week and say they wanted to match up to half of what's left. So $150,000 matching gift for the $300,000 left on the goal. All that means is, should God move your heart to give, if you give $10, it's actually 20. If you give 50, it's actually 100, so that we could finish this goal and bless a hope school to make a difference in the lives of children. Because what happens in the community is, people might be hostile towards your faith, but if you're investing in their kids, those things which might separate you sort of fall away. And that's exactly what's happening. God's using it. So if God moves to you to give, just know that your gift will be doubled because of the generosity of one individual in our church family. I love to see how God moves and how he works. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you're moving in our lives and in the world. And sometimes living here in the comfortable suburbs of uh, Chicagoland, we, we don't always see what you're doing around the world. But your gospel is bearing fruit and growing, not just here, but in faraway places. And we, that means we have brothers and sisters in Christ who we might not ever meet this side of heaven. We praise you for that and we thank you for the opportunity to be a part of that through our prayer and generosity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in our Advent series called The Spirit of Christmas, not to be confused with the Christmas spirit, which is cultural, but the role of the Holy Spirit in the story of, of Advent and Christmas. So I'd uh, like you to stand as I invite Phil to come and read to us the passage of God's word this morning. Uh, chapter 2, verses 22 through 35. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord... Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. That is a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit of the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God. And he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. 
For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his mother and father marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. May be seated. Well, I don't know what your uh, Christmas celebrations are like, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that the story of Simeon is not part of your traditional Christmas readings, if you have them. Simeon, old Simeon doesn't get much uh, press in the Christmas story. He's not, he's not typically associated with the Christmas story. I mean, even the animals and the innkeeper get more, uh, get more uh, face time than Simeon does at, at Christmas. But I'm going to suggest to you that the story of Simeon, which, which Phil just read for us, is actually the perfect Advent story. Because Simeon sees and is waiting for what God would do, and so many others miss it. He captures the heart of what it means to celebrate Advent well. Waiting and recognizing what God is doing when many around him miss it. In 2013, Cambridge University Press did a study of the most influential persons in human history. And they, they, the two professors that were uh, key in this was one uh, was named Stephen Skinner, who's uh, a avowed atheist. The other, Charles Ward, who's agnostic. Neither of them religious at all. One, uh, an overt atheist. And they were doing this study with a mathematical formula, measuring things like uh, cultural influence, historical influence, literary influence, and so on, trying to uh, remove any subjectivity from it, looking at people from Einstein to Aristotle. Guess who scored the highest on their objective scale? Can you guess? You're in church. You probably can't get this one wrong. It's not C.S. Lewis. <laughs> Jesus. And it wasn't even close. And if you read, you can Google this, and it's called Who's Bigger is the name of the, like the, 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 the results they posted in an essay, in a, in a, in a survey. And they, they were apologetic. They're like, look, we're not religious. We don't believe necessarily all the claims, but undoubtedly, Jesus of Nazareth was the most influential person by their own estimations and scale in human history. Yet, this most influential person in human history came into the world in obscurity, where most of the world's powers had no clue. Caesar didn't know or care. The Jewish schools of philosophy were not interested. Herod was too paranoid. Even the Jewish leaders, the rabbis and scribes and priests, missed it. But Simeon saw it. Simeon recognized. He was watching and he was waiting. The Dutch uh, painter Rembrandt painted the story or the picture of Simeon twice in his life. Once when he was 25 years old, early on, mastering his craft. You'll see an image here of that painting. Uh, notice the detail. It's hard probably to see from where you are, but if you Google this image, the detail is amazing. The temple is, is sort of dominant in the background. The priest there standing over, Mary and Joseph and, and Simeon stand, looking, the light shining on Simeon. There's more than a dozen individuals. You could spend hours looking at this painting in detail and not plumb the depths of. And it's really a study in how proficient Rembrandt was with the brush. Detail. He painted the story of Simeon again 38 years later, the year of his death. In fact, it was the last painting he ever completed. Here's an image of that painting. Notice the difference. This is an old man now, no longer interested in showing off how good he is with detail, but trying to capture the face and the heart and the spirit of a man who's near death, but has seen what God had promised. I think perhaps those paintings show us more about Rembrandt's heart than the content. But there's something in there. His focus is no longer on the temple and detail and the grandeur, but on the face of this man, Simeon. We don't know a whole lot about Simeon, or where he was from, or who his family was, or what his occupation was. In fact, we only see him here in Luke chapter 2. But we do get three really important details from this one verse, Luke 2, verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was... Righteous 
and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Three things about Simeon's life that we see in this one verse. He was righteous and devout. Righteous simply means he was doing right according to God's law. He was an obedient man, devout, a man of prayer, a man of commitment, a man of devotion to God. It doesn't mean he's perfect, but it means his life was characterized by faithfulness to God. He's, the Holy Spirit's upon him, and he's waiting for what is called the consolation of Israel. Waiting in the Spirit is the first thing I want you to see in the story here. Now, waiting is a key ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer is to help us to wait well. To wait on God well. How many of you like waiting? How many of you think waiting is my favorite thing? When I am in the checkout line, I look for the longest line with the most inept people, and I want to get behind them because it's my favorite. I love it. My wife and I flew to England and back, and we, you know, you do the security, you do the same thing, right? You're in the security line, and they, you come after, you go through and give them your, your boarding pass and your passport, and then you're looking, which one should I get in? That lady looks like she's confused about her shoes. I'm going to go over here to this line, and inevitably you choose wrong, no matter, even if it's the shortest one, something happens, right? We hate waiting in our culture. We're not good at waiting, we live in a culture where everything is, it's like we're conditioned to think waiting is bad. We want things fast. On Tuesday morning, I have, I'm in a men's group that meets at 5.30 a.m. I'm coming down my steps in my house at 5 a.m. And at the bottom of my steps is the front door. So I'm walking down. It's 5 a.m. It's dark. It's freezing. And I see a guy on my porch with his phone facing me taking a picture. I freaked out. I was like fight or flight reflex. It's an Amazon delivery guy. <laughs> my wife had ordered something the night before. At like 9, 9 p.m., she orders something, and he's there delivering it at 5 a.m. the next morning. <laughs> now, I'm all for, you know, fast deliveries, next-day deliveries, and express lines, but something's wrong in our culture. Spiritually speaking, waiting's a good thing, and we're not very good at it. Listen to what Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about this. Waiting is an art that our impatient age has forgotten. It wants to break open the ripe fruit when it's hardly finished planting the shoot. But all too often, the greedy eyes are only deceived. The fruit that seems so precious is still green on the inside, and in disrespected hands ungratefully toss aside what has so disappointed them. We want what we want now, and it's not good for us, spiritually speaking. There is something good about waiting on the Lord. The scriptures from Old Testament to New communicate this to us in, in all kinds of ways. Look what Jeremiah writes in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. That passage describes the heart of Simeon and his life. You see, waiting on the Lord, waiting in the Spirit, is not just killing time. Part of our trouble with waiting is we think it's a waste of time. Look, I got stuff to do. I can't wait in the ATM line 45 seconds. I've got things to do. I went yesterday, last night before I went to this Saturday night service, I went to Walmart, Target, and Sierra Trading Post and got nothing on my list. <laughs> so frustrated. What a waste of time I'm thinking as I'm driving to church to preach about waiting, right? <laughs> This is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. To the Christ follower, waiting is a certainty. It's connected to our hope, and hope doesn't disappoint us. It's not some vague wish for a better future. It's not killing time. It's not wasting time. It's trusting in God now for what he said he will do in the future. Look at verses, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Meaning if what you hope for and wait for never comes, that's not good. Makes you cynical. Heart sick. But a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. 
So old Simeon is waiting in the spirit, waiting for the consolation of Israel. That word consolation is a Greek word paraklesis. It's the same root word paraklete we use for the Holy Spirit. It can mean consolation, encourager, comforter, one who exhorts. So it's not like this consolation of your sorrow. That's only part of it. It's the encouragement. It's the fulfillment he's waiting for, for his people. He's waiting in the spirit for what the spirit will do. Waiting to see God's promises fulfilled. And even though we're not waiting for Christ to come the first time, we too are waiting to see God's promises fulfilled. Let's look at verse Luke 2, verses 26 through 27. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, notice how many times this shows up here, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit to the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. Now, verse 25 says that the Spirit was upon him. So we see the Spirit's upon him. The Spirit revealed something to him. And the Spirit led him into the temple. You notice the theme there? Somehow the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, had impressed on this old man's mind and heart that he's going to live long enough to see the fulfillment of God's promises. The longing. When you see the word Christ the Lord's Christ, that's not Jesus' last name. Right? Jesus, Christ, Christ is the transliteration of, of a term meaning Messiah. Jesus the Messiah, the Deliverer, the long-awaited promised one. So here's this old man. Next time you think of an old man with a white beard at Christmas time, don't think of Santa, think of Simeon. In the temple, waiting. Uh, it's amazing to me, as a pastor, I get to be with people, it's a privilege to be with people that are near the end of their life, in hospital rooms, in hospice care, in their own homes. And what shocks me and astounds me and moves me is very often God gives such clarity and focus to them about what really matters. When, you, when, you're, when you're about to leave this earthly life, suddenly things get clear in your mind and heart about what really matters. And what doesn't matter? I was in the hospital room with a man named Dwight Link a year and a half ago. And he was convinced that he was going to die soon. The nurses were thinking he might recover, but he was convinced that God had told him he's going to die. In fact, he'd watched online a Good Friday service where I preached about it, Jesus saying, it is finished. And so he's pulling out his tubes, yelling, it is finished, which is not something you should do in a hospital room, right? They came in and said, hey, Mr. Link, you don't have to, if God's going to do that, you don't have to hurry the process at all. But he was clear about it. his one desire was he wanted to see his children and grandchildren one more time before he, he died. To speak words of blessing and encouragement to point them to Jesus. And by God's grace, he was able to do that. We don't all get that answer to prayer. But he got to be in his hospital room with all of his family there. And one by one, he went down the row and told them about the love of God for them. What matters most. In a way, Simeon has this kind of clarity about what really matters in life. I think we need that kind of clarity, especially this time of year. If we be honest, there's a lot of distractions this time of year, aren't there? How many of you, if you don't have to raise your hand, but you know, you were supposed to be in the Christmas spirit, but some of us deep down inside are like, I'm just trying to get this done. I'm just trying to get the stuff done and get to the 26th. We need this kind of clarity about what really matters. Now, what's amazing is that Simeon's life, if you think about it, so uh, later in, the, in Luke 2, the next passage is about a, a prophetess named Anna who's also in the temple, a woman who fasted and prayed every day, and she too saw Christ for who he was. Uh, and she's 84 years old. Now, we don't know how old Simeon was exactly, but every indication was he's an old man. So if we put him at 84, 85, or older, uh, that seems reasonable. He's an old man waiting on the consolation God's deliverer to come. If you rewind the tape in history, in 63 BC, so Simeon would have been a young boy at this time, the general Pompey of Rome lays siege to Jerusalem, kills 15,000 Jews, and conquers the city, the capital, and Rome from that time onward occupies Israel. So all of Simeon's life, as a young boy to adulthood, all of his life, all he'd ever known was living under occupation, living under the oppressive thumb of Rome. Meaning, he looks out at the world and there's no indication that a deliverer is coming. 
Things are not getting better, but he's living in faith and in hope. This brings us to the promise of the Spirit. The promise of the Spirit. Here's the point for you and for me. It's possible to wait on God and to live with a certainty and a hope and faith even in a culture where there's no evidence that it's happening yet. That's Simeon's story. Look at Luke 2, verses 28 through 32. And this, by the way, this is the heart of the passage, if you're wondering, this, 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 these verses. He took him up, Jesus that is, in his arms, and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. By the way, this phrase, your salvation. What is Jesus' name uh, in Hebrew? Anybody know? Yeshua. Anybody know what Yeshua means? Your salvation. Jesus is a transliteration of the Hebrew word named Yeshua, which means the salvation of the Lord. So literally, Simeon is holding Jesus saying, my eyes have seen Yeshua. Yes, that's what his name means. That you have prepared the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. So this old man sees this poor young couple and by the way, remember when they were coming to the temple and they have two turtle doves? Did you know that in the 12 days of Christmas, two turtle doves is actually from the Bible? Two turtle doves. And some say that partridge in a pear tree is a euphemism for Jesus in the womb, but I don't know if that's true. Anyway, why do they have two turtle doves? If you read Leviticus 12, to, to dedicate your son, your firstborn, you're supposed to bring a young lamb and a pigeon or a turtle dove. But if you could not afford a lamb, there's a provision in Leviticus to bring two turtle doves instead. The point is, Mary and Joseph are poor. They can only afford the minimum. They're bringing Jesus according to the custom. So it's about 48 days after his birth, eight days for circumcision, 40 days after the birth for Mary to be purified and dedicate their son. Jesus is less than two months old. So think about it. They're bringing this, this poor peasant couple bringing this little baby in the crowds on the Temple Mount. And Simeon walks up and says, hey, uh, excuse me, can I hold your baby? <laughs> How many of you moms would think that's cool? Some old guy walks up, can I hold your baby? <laughs> no, who are you? Right? Was he checking all the babies? We don't know what was in Simeon's mind and heart. Was he there every day? And the priest was like, look, this crazy old guy, we can't stop him, just give him your baby. He's harmless. But he's there. And somehow the Spirit of God speaks to his mind and heart where he knows this is the one. This is what you've been waiting for. This is the one who was promised. And he takes him in his arms. And Simeon calls the baby God's salvation, Yeshua. Meaning the salvation of God is not a philosophy that you ascribe to or a religion you, you follow or a movement you're a part of or a, a party you vote for. The salvation of the Lord is a person who has a name. As in Peter and John, remember in Acts chapter four, they're on trial for preaching in the name of Jesus before the Sanhedrin, and they warned them, stop preaching. They're like, yeah, right, well, we can't, we're gonna keep doing it. And Peter says famously, there is no other name given under heaven by which we may be saved. Salvation is found in no one else, he says, but only in this name, the name of Jesus. And Simeon sees it for what it is. In fact, the rest of the Gospel of Luke and all the New Testament is a kind of unpacking and describing what Simeon says in what we call his song, verses 29 through 32. Now what's astounding about this is that Simeon is referencing Old Testament prophecies, but seeing through them, spoken more than 700 years before Jesus, into the future of what God would do. Let's look at a couple of those passages here, Isaiah. And see as we go through these, if you can find the echoes of what Simeon says in Luke 2. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. If, how have you seen Handel's Messiah? Anybody? There should be more hands than that. You're missing out, people. That's right out of Handel's Messiah. 
Do you know that phrase in Handel's Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that amazing when the choir sings and it builds, you know? Do you know where that comes from? Revelation 19. You know what's happened in Revelation 19? He's wearing a robe dipped in blood. He's carrying a sword. It's written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We sort of sanitize this and make it nice, but there's a hard edge to the story of Christmas. In chapter 42, verse six of Isaiah. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. Nations there, the Greek word for that is ethne. We translate it Gentiles in the New Testament. It just means anybody who's not a Jew. The rest of the world, in other words. In Isaiah 49, verse six. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. In chapter 52, verse 10, the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Simeon, holding the baby of a peasant couple in his arms, sees with the eyes of faith what God has promised, salvation for my people and for the world. What strikes me is that Simeon says all of this while holding a helpless baby born to a poor couple. Think about it for a minute. There's no halo over Jesus' head in this picture like there is in, in medieval and Renaissance art. He's not doing like little baby Jesus miracles like, like, like baby Yoda. He's not making things levitate. There's just, it's just a baby, just a peasant baby. How does Simeon know? How does he see? What is it that he grasps? He sees with what Paul calls the eyes of your heart, the eyes of faith. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which he's called you. There's a way of seeing that's more than just your physical eyes. That's what's happening here with Simeon, which brings us to the witness of the Spirit. The witness of the Spirit. By the way, when Simeon says, your salvation for all nations, all peoples, He's looking forward to what God would do. Because as a Jew, they're thinking of Messiah to deliver Israel, to throw out the Romans, to establish the throne of David for Israel. But Simeon sees more than that. Rebecca McLaughlin writes this in her little, little pamphlet, little book called It's Christmas Unbelievable. She says, Today Christianity is the most widespread, the most racially and culturally diverse belief system in the world. 31% of humans identify as Christian, and they are roughly evenly distributed between Europe, North America, South America, and Africa. And the church in China is growing so fast, there will almost certainly be more Christians in China than the U.S. by the year 2030. Do you know that Christianity, unlike any other major world religion, has no global center? It's global, as it was prophesied by Isaiah and said so by Simeon. So it is. And he sees that with the eyes of faith. So the witness of the Spirit. In our lives, the Holy Spirit helps us to believe things and trust things that would otherwise be difficult to grasp or believe. Have you ever had that experience? How many of you have ever, in a dark moment, questioned God's love for you? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> if your hand's not up, you're not listening to me or you're being dishonest, right? We've all had that. Can he forgive me? Does he love me? In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are indeed children of God. It's part of the job of the Holy Spirit to bear witness with, in your heart that these things are true, despite evidence to the contrary, despite what your own heart may tell you. Now let's look at verses 33 through 35 of Luke chapter two because here the story takes a bit of a strange turn. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own heart also so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. This is like the weirdest baby dedication in history. Can you imagine this? Like, like in the beginning, Mary and Joseph were like, light for salvation, glory to Israel. Yes, we know the angel told us this is awesome. And then he says, and many will fall. And many will rise and fall. And they will oppose him. And a sword's gonna pierce your heart. I imagine being Joseph like, hey, hey, time out. You can't talk to my wife that way. What are you, this is getting weird now, old man. What's going on here? Appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and in the world. 
Simeon is saying in a prophetic way by the witness of the Spirit that not everybody's going to love your boy. In fact, he's going to grow up and he will be at the same time the most loved and adored person in history and the most despised and rejected person in history. It will always be so. And it is so today. Some will rise with him. Some will fall because they will not accept him. They'll reject him. I imagine Mary hearing this, trying to make sense of it. And he says that he'll be a sign that is opposed. Not everybody's going to get on board with his, his life, his ministry, his teaching, his message. Jesus was and is a dividing line for people. We, we like to think of him as, you know, baby Jesus in the manger, the Prince of Peace, just the great unifier. But you know what he would say when he grows up in his adult ministry? He says, I did not come to bring peace, but division. What does he mean? What kind of peace is this? The peace that Jesus brings, and he is the Prince of Peace, he does come to bring peace, is through conflict. For example, how did the Allies bring peace in World War II? By just saying to the forces of, of the Nazi party, hey, peace, peace, let's all get along. No, by invasion, by conquering them. How does a surgeon bring peace to a body that has a growing malignant tumor? By cutting it open. The peace that Jesus brings is conflict in here. You have to recognize I'm sinful. I'm not okay as I am. I need a savior. I need one who would die on a cross for me. There's a dividing line. And Simeon, so the shadow of the cross falls over this scene with the old man holding Jesus. You really can't celebrate Christmas well as a Christian without the cross. If it's just baby Jesus in the manger, you're missing it. It's a nice story, but why did he come? What kind of peace is this? And then he says, a sign that is opposed. The apostle Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 through 24. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So right there, Paul's saying the same thing, isn't he? Jesus Christ and his cross and his message of salvation will be either foolishness, a stumbling block, or the power and wisdom of God based on how you receive him. And then this weird part where Simeon says, and a sword will pierce your own soul also. That's like a bummer way to end this amazing story, right? What's he saying to Mary? Well, Mary will be at the foot of the cross, won't she? And she will watch her son, her boy, be pierced through hands, through feet, and through side. You moms that are here, what's more piercing or painful than watching your child suffer? Is anything? That's what he's saying. A sword will pierce your soul also and reveal the hearts of many. Isaiah 53 verse five puts it this way. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Christ reveals the truth about us, whether we like it or not. He is a dividing line in history. Let's not sanitize or sentimentalize the story of Christmas. He did come to bring peace between us and God. But that peace comes at a cost. The cost of his life and of our surrender. I want to finish by coming back to Luke chapter 2, verses 30 through 31. This is really the heart of the text. Listen to what Simeon says once more. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared the presence of all peoples. The salvation of God has come, and it has a name, Yeshua, Jesus. Old Simeon saw it, while many missed it. I think that is profoundly relevant for us right now at Christmas time 2022. Do you see it? Because many miss it. Have your eyes, the eyes of your heart, seen the salvation of the Lord? I know for lots of you, you come to church, 
It's good. You got friends here. These are, these are nice people. That guy doesn't seem too weird up there. The music is good. This is. I'm asking you a question. Have the eyes of your heart seen the salvation of the Lord? Have you seen Jesus Christ as the dividing line of all of human history and of your life? And which side are you on? Jesus says, those who are not for me are against me. There's no neutral ground. We kid ourselves and think, well, I'm, 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 a, I'm an objective. I'm, I'm checking it out. The invitation is for all who will see, who have eyes to see. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we have just, just one week till Christmas morning. And if we're honest, we've got a lot of things to get done. Maybe we're a little stressed and distracted. But in this moment, we pray that your Holy Spirit would remove those distractions. We could hear the, clear, the clarity of your word. Speak to our hearts. Help us, like Simeon, to see through it all, your salvation, through your son Jesus, in whom we have hope for forgiveness of sins and for all eternity, and in whose name we pray, amen. Praise forever to the King of Kings, not just at Christmas time, but every moment of every day that he gives you life and breath. May the fellowship of God the Father and the love of his son Jesus Christ surround you and fill you this season and every season. And may he give you eyes like Simeon to see his salvation. Go in peace and Merry Christmas.